We're in Advent. We're a week away from Christmas. Yes. And I'm sure a lot of people are getting excited and a lot of people are getting stressed. And in all the busyness and all the chaos that surrounds this season, sometimes we forget about why we celebrate this season. And that's why Advent is an important season within the church. It's the four weeks leading up to Christmas. It's a time for preparation. A time to prepare us for almost experiencing a new birth or the birth of Christ afresh within us. And so we reflect back on the birth of Christ. We look forward to the second coming of Christ. But we also open out our hearts, our minds, our spirits to receive God afresh with us. And I'm hoping and I want to encourage you that if you haven't, please do. There are still the devotions going out and they are available on our website, the Advent Devotions. And we've had a few people contributing, which has been great. Um, just there for you to start reflecting, to get ready. And the overriding question that we've proposed, that we're asking is, what would it look like for Christ to be truly incarnate among us. If Jesus were really living in us, if Jesus had Jesus' way in the church, in our lives, what would our community look like? What would our church look like? That's the question. That's the reflection. What would your life look like? If what we confess with our mouths and allegedly believe in our hearts, if we lift that out. If you truly believe that God was with you every moment of every day. If you believe that God was aware of your interactions and your thoughts, truly aware. Would you be doing all the things you're currently doing? Would you be going to all the places you're currently going to? Would you engage with people the way you engage with people? Would you engage with those who are the least? Would you engage with those who annoy you? Would you engage with those in your own household the way you are now? These are hard questions to ask. Would our church, if Jesus was sitting in this pew this morning, would our behavior be what it is? Would my sermon be what it is? Sometimes what we say and the way we live don't always add up. And I speak of myself too. And this week, Advent 4's reading specifically look at the theme, firstly, of the promise by God through the angel to Mary and Joseph that their child will save people from their sins, bringing down the mighty and lifting up the lowly. And so Advent 4 calls people to reevaluate their attitudes towards power and poverty as we welcome the Christ child. And so I'm grateful we sang this song, this Calypso song. It says, you know, poor as the stable was, so was our king when he came. Jesus didn't come to the high and the mighty. He came to the lowly. As we said earlier, today's theme is love. And so if we look at love and we look at our attitudes towards power and poverty, we need to ask ourselves, what motivates me in the way I engage with people and with life? Do I count out to the rich and the powerful? Do I ensure that I keep favor with those who have influence in my life? Do I dismiss those who are less than, who... Maybe come to me begging or on the street. 
We need to examine our own attitude. One of the things I'm quite insistent about, and I learned it from another minister, was that I don't want to know who gives what. I don't. When stewards try and tell me, or whoever's in, I say, I don't want to know. Because whether I go and minister to you must be completely irrelevant of whether you tithe, don't tithe, how much you tithe, any of that. Because it is so easy to become ensnared through people who have money, who have influence, who have power. And so we need to avoid that at all costs. Because Jesus comes to us And when we see how Jesus ministered in his earthly life, those in positions of authority and power, he didn't treat with special favor. In fact, we know that he went to the least, the marginalized, the sinners, the outcasts. That's where we found Jesus. And so as we prepare for Christmas, as we prepare ourselves this Advent season, I want us to look at the figure of Joseph. We don't hear much about Joseph generally. It's not we, we, we hear about Mary and, you know, and we hear about Jesus. Uh, but Joseph is just nowhere to be seen. We get glimpses of him in Matthew and Luke's Gospels. Um, and then in Luke's Gospel, when Jesus is 12, we encounter Joseph again and that's it. Never again. I just want us to look a little bit at Joseph. Joseph is a person who had no power, no status, no authority. He was a carpenter. And we might have the image of a carpenter as somebody who's got a little carpentry business. But the truth of the matter is, is he was most likely a migrant laborer type carpenter. You know the guys that when you drive somewhere and they sit on the side of the road with a saw or a paintbrush? That sort of thing. Renting him yourself out for a day laborer type wage. Living from hand to mouth, most likely. If you've done manner and mercy, you'll have heard the term anawim. Anawim were those who were the least. Probably because of the way they had to live, were not ceremoniously clean. Like the shepherds that God appears to. The shepherds, because of them being out in the field and coming across dead animals and and all of this, would not have been ritually clean to be able to go into temple worship. But it's to those that God sends the message to come and worship Jesus. The least. The poor. And yes, Joseph. A person without status. Who is engaged to Mary. And Yari's blushing bride comes to him and says, I'm pregnant. But don't worry, I haven't been unfaithful. It's the Holy Spirit. Yeah? Yeah. I wonder what went through his mind. Because the text is quite clear. When he found out she's pregnant, he decided to leave her. He didn't buy the story. And I don't think any of us would. If your wife came to you, and you knew it couldn't be you, and said, I'm pregnant, but it's the Holy Spirit, you're going to go, yeah. Sure. Mm-hmm. Imagine, imagine Joseph's friends. Oh, congratulations, Joel, but I'm not the father. Oh. Hmm? That would have been an embarrassment, right? And so Joseph decides, well, and I would have too. Let me just leave her quietly. Joseph doesn't respond out of anger. In terms of the Jewish law, Joseph could have had Mary publicly shamed because he's the wrong party. He's the innocent party. He could have had her publicly shamed. He could have had her excommunicated, driven out of the community. He could even have had her stoned to death in terms of the Jewish law for committing adultery. (laughs) 
If your fiancé came to you and said, I've been unfaithful, and you had all of this power, what would the temptation be? You hurt. I've seen people do horrible things when they've been hurt. Especially if you got the upper hand. You got the moral high ground. But out of all of these options, Joseph says no. I'm not going to shame her further. I'm not going to make a big public spectacle of her. I'm going to leave her quietly. Just divorce her quietly. She can carry on with her life. I'll carry on with my life. I think that is the most loving, kind thing that any human being would do. It shows integrity. It shows gentleness. It shows kindness. Joseph responded in love and not reacted in anger and bitterness. And not only that, when the angel appears to Joseph and says to him, look, Mary is not making this up. Genuinely, God made her pregnant. Um, And you'll raise this child. Joseph embraces the responsibility. The angel gives the responsibility and the authority to Joseph to name the child. Jesus. The Jewish name would have been Yeshua or Joshua, means God saves. It's the Greek translation that we use the name Jesus. And so Joseph names the child when he's born Jesus in instructions from the angel. Joseph embraces this authority that. And this position of care that he has to offer to God's Son. Raising him. Looking after him. Caring for him. Loving him. Being with him. Being the father to him that God wanted Joseph to be. And so I wonder, I wonder. I came across this picture. That's Joseph. I don't know how clearly you can see it. But for me, it's a beautiful picture. And I wonder if we don't ignore Joseph at our peril. I came across this quote by Michael Cross. He says, When male pastors, and I think he deliberately uses male pastors, when male pastors call on us to recover something called biblical manhood, I suspect they're not thinking of the silent, loyal Joseph submitting himself humbly to his wife's God-given calling. And I think he's right. Joseph's not the image of manhood that society portrays, is it? The silent, loyal, caring person supporting his wife who has the bigger calling. And so where am I going with all of this? If we have to say, what would it look like for Christ to be incarnate among us? I suspect that some of us, and I'm talking to us men particularly, might need to change the way we act and the way we behave. I think all of us might need to question, how do I respond when I'm hurt? How do I react when somebody has harmed me, especially when I'm in the right? And I speak to couples too, especially. You're now celebrating your anniversary. You are in the church, so congratulations. We've tried a few times. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is you wouldn't... There's times you have to forgive each other. There's times where we hurt each other. I used some of this text yesterday at a wedding that I did. And I said, you're going to hurt each other. You're going to let each other down. You're going to disappoint each other. All of us who are married know these things. And those of us who are like 
dating and you know all starry eyed it's going to happen she's going to upset you he's not going to be as perfect as he seems to be now we hurt each other don't we sometimes unintentionally sometimes very deliberately and what is our response what are we going to do are we going to take the moral high ground and beat our opponent to death because that's what the world calls us to do isn't it Trample everybody around you. Get the victory. In relationships, we can choose to be right or we can choose to remain in relationship. Sometimes the two are mutually exclusive. I have been right to my detriment. Hmm? It's how we do things that's important. And so... How do we respond? Joseph was in the right. He could have had Mary publicly shamed, killed for that matter. But instead he responds in gentleness and love, puts the other first. And so I want to encourage all of us this Advent season that we put our egos and our own desires and our own need for power aside. That we embrace the way God calls us to live. It doesn't mean we're doormats. But it does mean that we treat other people with respect and with love. That we don't always demand our own ways. That even when we are hurt and wronged, we don't try and exact vengeance, but we respond in love. And Jesus said that pray for those who persecute you, eh? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And sometimes, may I say, that the hardest people to love who hurt you are those in your family, those closest to you, because there you're the most vulnerable. But let us take an example from Joseph and let us love. Let us ask God to help us let go of status, of privilege, of power, of position and instead embrace humility, gentleness and love. And through that, may we experience a new birth of Christ within us as individuals, within our societies, within our community, within our families this Christmas. And may that result in us experiencing Jesus truly incarnate among us. Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you that you came not to a position of power and prestige, but you came to the least, the humble, the gentle. Father, we thank you that you chose somebody like Joseph, somebody who we don't hear much about, but somebody who sets an example of gentleness, of loyalty, of faithfulness, of love that we can follow and emulate. And so help us as we journey towards Christmas and to open our hearts up to receiving you in new ways, to letting go of our need for control, our need for power, and instead embrace a way of living faithfully in your kingdom. And so we ask that, Jesus, you would be incarnate afresh among us this Advent season. We ask this all in your holy and precious name. Amen.